Thank you. So I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government and I'm here simply to welcome you all to the school and say how honoured we are to have President Motlante visiting the school for the second time. Last time he was with us it was to lead on work um, in the school on finding fiscally sustainable strategies for dealing with HIV AIDS across the continent and President Motlante's contributions to that project were fantastic and great leadership. We're very honoured to have you back. But to, to introduce uh, President Motlante fully, I'd like to welcome also to the school Jodi Ndumir. Would you like to? Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I join Professor Woods in welcoming all to this conversation on the challenges of governance in Africa, um, hosted by the Africa Oxford Initiative, the Blavatic School of Government, as well as the University of Oxford Africa Society. Um, my name is Njordi Ndonyema. I am a Namibian student of law here, and I am um, here to effectively introduce our two speakers. Uh, but before I do that, um, allow me to also touch briefly on the Africa Society, which is co-hosting this event, um, for the benefit of those of you who are unfamiliar with it. The Africa Society is a student club that has had a presence in the University of Oxford since 1959 and has over the years been a galvanizing forum for students from Africa and those interested in Africa um, to, amongst others, discuss those issues affecting Africa and her peoples um, and in so doing provide some thought leadership uh, through debate. Um, chief amongst these questions is that uh, of the quandaries around governance in Africa. What are the issues affecting governance in African countries? What is imp impeding the emergence of African countries from the scourge of governance deficiency? More specifically, why has the ANC failed to govern effectively in South Africa? And what are the key lessons for African youth as they prepare to assume positions of responsibility in government? I think uh, there is no better place to host such a conversation than here at the Blavatnik School of Government, a school uh, that has been a strong partner for the African society over the years and which has a stated mission uh, to inspire and sp support government, uh, better government and public policy around the world. I also hold the view that our two guests today uh, are aptly placed to explore these questions together with us uh, as they have both a lived experience through the struggle of fighting for the right to self-govern. Um, they have witnessed a transition from one illegitimate form of minority white rule in South Africa to another, that of dem democratic rule, and have uniquely served at the highest levels of government in their country. As you are aware, our two speakers today are President Katlema, Kat Katlema Motlane and Dr. Kulum Bata. Um, our conversation will proceed as follows. First, uh, I will invite Dr. Mbata to give us an address of about 20 minutes, um, followed by an address by President Motlate. Uh, finally, we'll open up the floor for a question and answer session with our two conversationalists, um, and the audience will have 40 minutes to explore uh, questions around the challenges of governance, um, as I am sure you have them. Um, and we'll wrap up the evening Oh, by inviting another partner and co-host of this event, um, the Africa Oxford Initiative, to close the event. Um, please note that this event is being live streamed. Um, therefore, if you do not wish to form part of the digital record uh, that will be this event, uh, then you'll have to forego your opportunity to ask a question. Um, but without further ado, uh, allow me to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Kulumbata. Uh, he has served as a special advisor to President Katlema Mutlate. Uh, he has spent almost 20 years as a student and diplomat in various uh, countries in Africa, uh, Europe, and the United States, and has over 40 years experience in international relations. Um, he was the chief representative for the ANC in Athens, Greece from 1988 to 1990, and a coordinator of the ANC National Executive Committee from 1991 to 1994, um, which was a seminal period given that South Africa was transitioning to democracy at the time. He also worked for the late 
uh, Minister Alfred Nzo, the first minister, the first foreign minister, and later served as minister councillor to the permanent mission to the UN of South Africa. He was also consular general in Munich, Germany, and deputy director in the Department of Home Affairs in South Africa. Uh, perhaps opportunely and pertinent to this event, uh, Dr. Mbata has recently published a book uh, earlier this year on the very topic of governance entitled um, Unmasked, Why the ANC Failed to Govern, and we will share some views related to this publication. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kulumbata to this podium. The Dean of the Vladmanic School of Governance, Professor Ngaire Woods, the President of the African Society at Oxford and Student of Law, Mr. Njodi Deriema, thank you for inviting me to speak about my book. His Excellency, former President of South Africa, Mr. Khalima Mutante, and his delegation, among them we have Dr. Oscar van Yerden, who is the trustee of the Halima Mutlante Foundation, the entire leadership and student body of the School of Governance. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to come to this prestigious and historic cradle of learning, the oldest university in, in, in the English-speaking world. I am thrilled by the fact that I am following in the steps of thousands, if not millions of scholars who have visited this entire center of learning, where many a religious and political dispute took place. It reminds me of my days when I was a student of philosophy in one of the oldest universities of Germany, namely the Friedrich Schiller University where I learned about the 17th century Oxford philosopher, John Locke, one of the most influential early Enlightenment thinkers and a major figure of the social contract theory, who was forced to flee this country because of his philosophical views. I must say, I feel very humbled to be standing on this platform today, especially to be hosted by the Vlad Bladvanik School of Governance. I'm here to speak to you about my book, Unmasked, Why the ANC Failed to Govern. Before I speak to the book itself, I'd like to say the following. As you heard from the introductory remarks, I left South Africa in 1976 in the aftermath of the students' uprisings and joined the ANC in exile. After my studies in Germany, I came back to Lusaka in Zambia and worked in the Secretary General's office under one of its long-serving leaders, Comrade Alfred Zoh. Subsequently, when the ANC was unbanned in 1990, I came back the following year in 1991 and rejoined the Secretary General's office, which was for a very short time under Comrade Zoh, and then it was Comrade Cyril Ramaphosa, the current deputy president of the ANC in the country, who took over as secretary general. This was a period of the historic negotiations in South Africa from 1991 to 1994. From this background and arising from many other factors, my work in government, especially in the presidency, the interaction with bureaucracy, the general public, members and supporters of the ANC, it became clear to me that there are questions that have arisen and are not adequately attended to or answered. But this was and is not limited to South Africa only. Many people here in the United Kingdom and other countries, especially those who supported the struggle against apartheid and were in the anti-apartheid movement, 
also academics and professionals like you here are asking the same questions about what is happening in South Africa and what direction is the ANC following? What happened to the ANC's mission? Sorry. Basically, these and other questions seek to establish what has really happened to our politics, our vision, our leadership, our ethics, and so forth. What is also implicit in this question is the issue about what can be done to get us out of this situation. Before I attempted to deal with the flood of questions, it became clear to me that these are questions that to a greater extent related to policies, the guidebook of any organization or state. Since it is policies that I needed to examine so that I can give answers to these questions, to do this properly, one needed to be open and sincere. These policies do not amass to issues only related to failure to govern. The failure to govern is just a manifestation of much deeper challenges. These are varied and complex and have accumulated over many years from the time the ANC was banned in 1960 to the 30 years of exile and to the 23 years since freedom and democracy were established. These have had such an influence on the ANC's image, character, and ideology, on its organizational structures and practices, and will need to be unpacked and re-examined for one to understand where the causes of these failures originate. The change, the transformation which South Africa has to go through, although it started in 1994 with the establishment of democracy, is far from complete or being perfect. Many of us thought 1994 is everything under the sun. And when today we see that things are not going the right way, we think that those that came before us and faced these challenges sold out. Nothing from the truth. They had their shortcomings and they were simply products of their time. Every generation has its task. As Lebu Keswa, a newspaper commentator, correctly stated that, and I quote, Building of nations from a warlike situation as we, had, as we had under colonial and apartheid rule will always be a delicate negotiation that involves both the oppressed and the oppressor. The reality of South Africa, of the South African story, is that there was no insurrection or total victory, but a negotiated settlement with its typical give and take resulting in compromises. While most of these youngsters know how to recite the historical conjecture described as colonialism of a special type, they seem to fail dismally to appreciate the consequences of such a reality that manifested in the 1994 settlement and the subsequent government of national unity. Every generation has to decide on a path and pursue it to the end, end of quote. Here we are, 23 years after we established democracy, we find ourselves out of tune with many things that matter as we face the triple challenge of poverty, unemployment, and inequality, our nation is unraveling at the same time. Incidents of racism are increasing and intolerance seems to be growing. How do we explain all this? Now, as early as eight months after the first democratic elections of 1994, Nelson Mandela and Cyril Ramaphosa, the then President and Secretary General of the ANC, addressed the 49th National Conference of the ANC. Mandela was direct and brutally frank. He said, and I quote, never before has the ANC had to address such crucial questions about itself. Seldom before have we experienced such dislocation as in the few months after the elections, 
In this regard, we should be self-critical about the manner in which we conducted ourselves in this period. Ours was not a planned entry into government. Except for the highest echelons, we did not have a plan for the deployment of cadres. We were disorganized and behaved in a manner that could have endangered the revolution." End of quote. After those opening remarks, Ramaphosa followed by stating the following, and I quote, the state of organization of the ANC is also a cause for concern. The ANC has struggled to find its feet in the political terrain of the new South Africa. This problem has been exacerbated by key members of the organization moving into government and into the National Assembly and provincial legislatures. Even within our ranks, there has been confusion about what the positions of the organization on certain matters are. End of quote. This was an indication that something had gone wrong. From which period do the failures originate? During or after Nelson Mandela's presidency ended in 1999? After the events of Polokwane in December 2007, when Thabo Mbeki lost the presidency of the ANC to Jacob Zuma, I decided to trace the problems of the ANC from the time it was banned in 1960 and its rebirth in exile. Rebirth meant new structures with totally different challenges in foreign countries than those that the ANC had confronted back home. The first chapter introduces the exile years 1960 to 1990. I look at how the ANC re-established itself in foreign territories. I examine those aspects that made the ANC strong and those that had negative influences. The quality of collective leadership that the ANC demonstrated during the course of exile played a significant part in laying down a solid foundation for unity. Organizational discipline and political education were the strength that led to success. International solidarity was another pillar of strength, but it would be difficult to explain the ANC's far below expectation performance in government today if I did not show the shortcomings it exhibited in exile. It is important to reveal this, as we know, Apartheid was an international problem happening during the Cold War, and the, and the following issues became a challenge. First, choosing friends. While the ANC is the oldest nationalist and pan-Africanist organization on the African continent, and of course, its founding leaders had been educated in overseas countries, mainly in the United States and United Kingdom, the majority of them had not been to other African countries. Therefore, they were not familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of the nationalist movements on the continent. So, ANC leaders like Mandela, O.R. Tambo, Andrew Mlangeni, and many others were shocked to find out that African leaders rejected the ANC mainly because of the Freedom Charter and embraced the PAC because of its call for Africa, Africa for Africans. And these were leaders like Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Gaunda, Ben Bella, uh, Hale Selassie of Ethiopia. Two, I mean not two, sorry, that was A for B. The same happened in the whole world, the ANC had to choose its friends in the East and the West. And of course, for those days, we used to say between progressive and reactionary forces. Secondly, communication. 
Communication within the organization suffered because members of the movement were scattered all over the world, mainly in European countries, and to some extent, this put them out of touch which, with reality back home. Thirdly, thinking in formulas. Thinking in formulas led to stereotyping, and as a result, there was a lack of innovation and no modernity no modernization took place. What does it mean, thinking in formulas? It means if the Soviet Union thinks, thinks that this is right for Czechoslovakia or Hungary, the next time an issue arises in Bulgaria or in Africa, Mozambique, the same formula would be applied. This means there was no innovation. Fourthly, False interpretation. False interpretation of the balance of forces internationally and the power play game, especially during the 1980s, deep in the Cold War. The 60s and 70s maybe were predictable, and there was a lot of anger. You, you could pinpoint your enemies. But with Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and Helmut Kohl, ascending to power, the play game changed. It changed so much that nobody knew what, was the, what would be the outcome. But this play game influenced the liberation movement to such an extent that they just took it, no, it's just a war between the two. But as we know, later, the fall of the Soviet Union led to other things consequences, especially for Southern Africa, starting from uh, uh, Zimbabwe today, Namibia, and then South Africa. I'll come to that. Now, fifthly, disregard for, general, for the general membership. Disregard means for the general membership and the, and the creeping in of unethical behavior, corruption, and in some cases, the killings that took place in the ANC camps in Angola, for example. Sixthly, and lastly, skepticism. Skepticism creeps in because the white, regime, white racist regime in South Africa was very stubborn. So you hated your enemy to such an extent that you never thought that one day you will have to sit down and negotiate. So, the negative attitude towards the regime, the negative that transplanted into a negative attitude to all Western countries, and of course, to the economy of South Africa. If you take all documents of the ANC, the strategy, mainly the strategy and tactics documents drawn up in 1969, the economy is not mentioned at all. It comes right at the end of that document, and it is described as enemy number one, the economy. Forgetting, okay, maybe shortcoming weakness of that is that the economy was a, a living organism because of the black labor. So it embodied the sweat of our people. So it could not be totally designated as an enemy. Now, in the second chapter, I examined the transition of the ANC from an unlawful organization to, to one that was legal and had to negotiate a settlement. I looked at the pre-negotiations and negotiation period and the elections of 1994 that led to the victory of the ANC. I scrutinized the meaning of the compromises made in the course of finding a peaceful settlement. These compromises arose around the negotiations table, far away from the masses of the people. There was a gap between the negotiators and those on whose behalf they were negotiating, and there was no attempt made to bridge the gap. There were resolutions taken. 48 and 49 national conferences to close this gap, but as we see today. 
there, is, there are those who look at CODESA and think, no, we don't, especially the youth, we don't agree with this. I then argue, I then argue that the 1994 victory had such an impact on the ANC that it influenced and changed its character forever. For a new nation born out of the ravages of a bitter struggle, this surely affected the way forward and the process of building a new nation. The third chapter explores the first two national conferences, the 48th in 1991 and the 49th in 1994, that is pre before the elections and after the elections of 1994 that had brought victory to the ANC. These conferences provide evidence indicating that the ANC was undergoing a vigorous change, and this is when the derailment of the ANC train happened. One notices that it never recovered from the incapacities inherited since then and has therefore failed to master its own transition from a liberation movement to a political and governing party. The fourth chapter looks at the ideologies that influence the ANC. And I must emphasize now, freedom and democracy are irreconcilable with the concept of an endless national democratic revolution, what is called the NDR. They don't go together. I do analyze the ideological roots of this elusive NDR and the confusion it has brought into the South African terrain of struggle and liberation. The fifth chapter focuses on the post-1994 period. I asked the simple question about whether the ANC was ready to govern. As my answer is in the negative, I then untangled the complex socio-economic relationship and the new conditions of democracy in South Africa. The ANC had not time to deliberate and consider the new terrain of engagement. It had moved straight from the negotiations to elections and then into parliament. This among other causes, is where things went wrong. That's what is being addressed in the quotations from Nelson Mandela and Cyril Ramaphosa. What does the future hold for South Africa? In the sixth chapter, I identify six impediments to nation building and social cohesion. First impediment, this debate about freedom charter, whether it is socialist or capitalist is a waste of time because in the history there were people who were arrested and they stood in the prison trial and the government proved i mean failed to prove that this document is a communist socialist document so there are people today i don't think out of love or what they like debating whether Freedom Charter is capitalist or socialist. It's a waste of time. Secondly, the lack of a clear strategy in the ANC to deal with the economy. I think this is one of the main failures, shortcomings of this liberation movement. Uh, when it came into government, having not produced any document during the exile years, eight years, it started with a document called MERC which was a negotiated document between the Communist Party, uh, the trade union movement, and the ANC, it was called MERC. But this document was not adopted. Instead, the ANC adopted what we called the RDP, Reconstruction and Development Plan. It lasted only for two years, 94 to 96. Then we adopted GEAR. GEAR uh, took us up to 2000. In 2000, we came with another economic strategy uh, uh, called Askiza. Askiza also with the change of, uh, say, uh, from President Begi to uh, President Zuma, we had another document strategy called the new growth path in 2010. 
And two years later, we had a, a new document. It's called the National Development Plan. Now, it's as if there's been a change of many governments in South Africa, but this has been the same party. The question is, why so many changes? We'll discuss that. But it's one of the weaknesses. It's one of the weaknesses. Third, the third impediment, the perpetual existence of the tripartite alliance. Uh, I wanted to read, but I think let me just explain. Uh, the ANC proud itself that in the government we have a tripartite alliance government. Nelson Mandela, President Nelson Mandela, forewarned the ANC at its first conference and said he recognizes the role that the alliance has played, especially during the exile years when they were in prison, others were scattered all over. And without this alliance, I myself don't think it would have been possible to pursue the struggle as we did. Then he says, going forward, moving forward, the ANC must rethink how we bring about, uh, how we put together a, a government that can be representative of the whole nation. By that he meant that one, uh, it's not the ANC that freed the people of South Africa. The ANC was the leader. The people have freed themselves through the civic organizations, the United Democratic Front that brought so many, so many forces, uh, the religious bodies, the churches, Desmond Tutu, and so on. And therefore, Nelson Mandela said, we must rethink how we reconfigure this alliance, whether we take it along or we, we reconstruct it. But uh, if you look at the resolution of, those co of that conference, nothing was done. Today, uh, as we follow what is happening at home, there is a big, big, big conflict within the tripartite alliance. As you know, it is that's this alliance that brought President Jacob Zuma uh, to power in 2009. So, fourthly, uh, the endless national democratic revolution. The ANC characterizes itself as a both as both a national liberation movement and a political party. It, sounds, it does sound revolutionary, but if you are both a national liberation movement, in simple terms, defining or characterizing a liberation movement, a liberation movement it's a community of people, it's a nation that is oppressed nationally, racially, or colonially. And it has an enemy, concrete enemy, that it must fight and move out of power. That's what we had. Now with the ANC being government, is it still a national liberation movement? When I asked this question, and seriously, as we are preparing for the policy conference uh, that has just recent, that recently took place, I asked, who is the enemy? They tell me, no, it's poverty. I say, no, you can say you need a national liberation movement. So there is this endless revolution. Endless, I don't know when it will end. But that's one of the impediments. The other impediments are the remnants 
of racism. But it is not the type of racism that we experience as the oppressed in South Africa because that racial oppression was legislated. There are certain things that were not open or given or allowed to African people. Today, with the ANC in government, it has changed. There's no legislation that deprives people of this opportunity or not. But you see, you, you are limitless, or let me say, you are limited, sorry. You are limited in how far you can deal with racism because racism is a phenomenon that does not stand alone. As long as people sleep with empty stomach and they can see other people, life is normal, and they can identify these people as this with the attitudes of the past. It means in nation building, other things should take place in order to bring about social cohesion. You cannot always legislate. And our people then, or let me say African people then say, no, is the same racism as we experienced in the past. But I argue that it's not the same because uh, today we have uh, institutions that have been created, established to deal with these matters. But racism is still there. Then there is, lastly, the slow po process of reconciliation, like racism, social cohesion. It means in the cultural field uh, to change the attitudes of people, to influence them positively. But as long as the economic situation does not favor for such reconciliation to take place smoothly, you will have then, as we have today, uh, incidents of racism, including killings. The last chapter explores the way forward. If we do away with these imped impediments, it will positively influence the future of South Africa's development and prosperity. But for this to happen smoothly, we need, to, we need the cooperation and contribution of every South African, black, colored, Indian, and white. The need for the realignment of forces for change is long overdue. Only an organization with clear-cut objectives and a visionary, and a visionary leader will be able to lead the forces for change into the future. Only a governing party as the constitution of the new South Africa envisage and not a ruling party that can work and encourage the principle of deliberative democracy. That party will need a modern constitution of its own that is reflective of our times Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, if there is a time in history, in the history of South Africa, that its people, black, colored, Indian, and white, should unite for a common purpose, it is now. This is partly because of the crisis we find ourselves in, and it is also because of the vast opportunities that present themselves. These opportunities want us to have a conversation or dialogue. Uh, again, Lebu Keswa says, and I quote, a wrong diagnosis that seeks to paint everything with a doomsday, with a doomsday brush, or paint everything in glowing terms will not take us forward in that dialogue and will create resentment that we don't need. No one can ignore that the legislative framework that characterize apartheid governance has been removed. At the same time, it is crucial to realize that the mere removal of this terrible legislation has not for millions of people translated into economic emancipation. The story of land deprivation alone paints a terrible picture of a people that we were of a people that were expected to reconcile on a hungry stomach, end of quote. 
it is my belief that we can further strengthen the changes that came with freedom and democracy in 1994 so that more people can benefit from the democratic dispensation, irrespective of their race, the color of their skin, their religious beliefs, sexual orientations, and party affiliations, or where they originate from. My book is designed to advance the understanding of some aspects of what is known as the national question in South Africa. It is my humble contribution towards the body of political science that deals with post-liberation theory in the context of national liberation movements. As Gugun Dima puts it, and I quote, for its survival, the ANC must embody what South Africa is in the form of a leader. South Africa is young and agitated. The ANC and South Africa need a generational revolt. The entire continent needs Macrons to lead them to the future. Macron is probably no genius or maverick. However, his win in France represents the growing voices in need of change and new ideas. Africa needs progressive young leaders with no bondages from the past and who will take the continent to greater heights. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mbata, for those remarks. Um, Dr. Mbata's book is also available for, for purchase today, and I think uh, he will be available to autograph those uh, books that are purchased today. Um, I think you have provoked us a lot, uh, particularly the youth. There were, they were comments that were directly uh, directed to us, um, and I think we can explore some of those questions around the, Af the, the um, Freedom Charter and so forth. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, President Montlante. Uh, he has permitted me to forego his introduction, uh, but I will mention this, that uh, he is um, uh, the former president of South Africa and also spent time on Robben Island. And yesterday when uh, we met up in London, he was narrating some of his experiences with his Namibian comrades. And uh, the remark that he said that, uh, after suffering so long with so many people, you cannot forget them. Um, so I invite President Montlante to give us a few remarks, and after which we'll have a Q&A. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, President of the African Society at Oxford University and student of law, Mr. Njodi Dionyema. You are very kind. Uh, I've had the dubious privilege of uh, listening to my obituary being read under pretext of being introduced. <laughs> And, and the local mayor who did that uh, ended by saying, may his soul rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> and Dean Gary Woods and all the professors and staff of the uh, Blatvanik uh, School of Government and the students uh, I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to have some time to engage around the theme of challenges of governance in Africa. In, in my address uh, this afternoon, I wish to draw a bit of uh, our own experience in South Africa to provide the necessary post-colonial context in order to render our discussion uh, more intelligible. 
I'm doing this aware that while an African nation, as an African nation, South Africa shares much with the rest of the African continent historically, there are some telling differences as well. Yet fundamentally the question of governance is a choice in the hands of political actors. It is important to compare notes to better identify areas of weaknesses and thereby redress. In this connection, I wish to draw comparisons between the choices of our own country as well as the choices of other sister countries on the African continent pertaining to leadership and therefore governance. Without complicating an already complicated concept, let us just agree that broadly defined, governance is about coordinating social life, especially that of a polity. In this restricted sense, then, governance therefore presupposes government. It therefore follows that governance to be effectual, government as the driving force should necessarily be effective. There is no question about it. Many African nations are blighted by the malady of bad governance. Invariably, bad governance leads to discontentment, which in turn leads to violence and destabilization of countries. This has been the African story for many years and continues to be the case today. At the end, it is the ordinary African men and women and children who bear the brunt of all this. Most heart-rending stories of men, women and children braving the hostile conditions across the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean Sea to seek greener pastures in Europe, both as legal and illegal migrants testify to this untold human suffering. That the world has in time grown numb to this grim human toll does not make it any less of an indictment on the moral fiber of our times. Because of poor governance, a myriad of problems are entrapping young African lives in an existence of indignity, a life without basic necessities, and therefore a life shorn of human decency. In this context, where leadership exists in name only, all challenges prove insurmountable. The challenge of climate change, for instance, needs leadership. So too is the AIDS pandemic, which as we have painfully witnessed in our own country, often sidelines young adults to lives dominated by sickness and leaves scores of children orphaned. Pick any problem, be it global economic crisis, massive worldwide immigration, terrorism, illiteracy, poverty, etc. All of these problems require a leadership which acts boldly and decisively. Outside the context of visionary leadership, which in turn assumes built for purpose independent and effective social, economic, and political institutions, societies are unable to make meaningful breakthroughs. What is disturbing is that while pandemic to the African continent, such difficulties are not immutable laws of nature ordained specifically for the people of our continent. Instead, they are historical problems. They are embedded in and reflect a particular history of Africa. 
It is a history which South African political actors, especially the liberation movement, sought to avoid at the dawn of our democracy. Our observation of this historical experience as South Africans went a long way towards shaping our approach to the process of hammering out the new society out of the ashes of apartheid. The late President Nelson Mandela gave a particularly memorable interpretation of this observation about the political imperative to build democratic institutions and culture that would bankroll the future we sought to achieve. Not that our transitional process was smooth or that our institutions and therefore governance is fault proof. It is anything but that. However, we remained alive to the tenet at the core of the vision for a society envisaged by our forebears, that is a democratic dispensation. Without a system of constitutional democracy, there would be nothing to cement us together as a nation, given our fractious history. We appreciated the need for a political framework that would guide our efforts, not only in the reconstruction and development process, but most importantly, in working out a shared vision for all of us and setting out to attain this vision. Our system of constitutional democracy, at the heart of which sit the separation of powers, the Bill of Rights, and as well as institutions established to support democracy and an independent media made sure checks and balances were built into the logic of our political system. This way, no one individual or interest group could, no matter how powerful, ride roughshod over any of these politically sanctified entities without due consequences. Still and all, South Africa does face its fair share of political challenges, not least of which is the area of governance. I will return to the South African case shortly. Safe to say, once again, corruption, self-aggrandizement, and sleaze are yet again among the chief features of this blight. I insist that while corruption and other pathologies are endemic to modern political systems of all description, the post-colonial nations have been particularly vulnerable to these ills insofar as they impinge on governance, undermining the only means of catalyzing development. In a way, it cuts both ways. Poor governance results from poor leadership as weak institutions foil good leadership. A leadership can only be strong to the extent that its institutions are strong, independent, and effective. By the same token, effective institutions provide the necessary traction for leadership to deliver. As we have learned in our own country's history, poor governance is largely a function of flimsy political systems where the judiciary lacks independence, the executive commands disproportionate power, independent media is weak, civil society exists in name only, and the basic rights of citizens, including socioeconomic and political rights, are virtually non-existent. In such cases, no system of checks and balances exists. Political impunity by the political class holds sway and arbitrariness by the elites is the order of the day. With this historical background as a foil, South Africa sought to define itself within the orbit of modern democracies, fully aware that development and reconstruction of a society 
as economically unequal and socially divided as ours are ineluctably pre predicated on the rule of law, on entrenchment of justice and democracy, as well as a Bill of Rights as the key starting points of the newly constructed polity. All the foregoing are elements which constitute the scaffolding on which a democratic South Africa could be constructed. One of the first steps in the normalization of our society and the creation of universal respect for the rule of law in South Africa was the adoption of our constitution, which provides for a culture of rights, responsibilities, and freedoms. However, in the context of a nation where these rights had been denied to the majority of the people experience, South Africa is committed to an African continent which is constitutional, democratic, stable, non-racial, non-sexist, united, and prosperous, and which contributes to a world that is just and equitable. Without these ingredients, no good governance is possible or at least durable. While the governance in Africa continues to be a cause for concern, we have been heartened by the recent developments in Kenya, especially on the judiciary front. Incidentally, Kenya, like South Africa, is a constitutional democracy defined by the principle of judicial review a principle which valorizes the supremacy of the Constitution. It was on the strength of the system of constitutional democracy that the Kenyan judiciary was able to exercise its powers on the allegations of the hacking of the IT system in the counting process. Africa needs a transformed judiciary that relates to and understands the realities of the society it is rooted in. It is also crucial that we have a judiciary that the overwhelming majority of the people of our continent identify with and support. In this conversation about the independent judiciary, we dare not forget the central issue of gender representation too. It is a crucial index of social progress in terms of social justice. Africa needs an independent judiciary among the preconditions for laying the foundations for the development of a society based on human dignity, equality, and fair administration of justice. African governments and ruling parties have a duty to unequivocally pledge their commitment to, to their respect for the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law. One needs not make the obvious point that the independence of the judiciary as a guarantor of free democratic expression is indispensable for good governance. In this regard, it was encouraging to hear the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa and the head of the Constitutional Court come out in support of the, his Kenyan counterpart in the face of unwarranted attacks by political leadership on the latter. Such bold public support of fellow African counterpart on principle points up a shared intra-Africa. Yet another issue that sticks out like a sore thumb on the African landscape is the controversies surrounding the International Criminal Court. The ICC is charged with the responsibility to throw the book at perpetrators of crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide, among others. In like manner, the current democratic South African state is founded on the notion of human rights and justice as enshrined in our constitution adopted in 1996. Key values that define our democratic state include human dignity, human rights and freedoms, equality, 
non-racialism and non-sexism, supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. The centerpiece of our Constitution is the Bill of Rights, which contains civil and political rights, including just justifiable socioeconomic rights. Our approach to foreign policy was and still is steeped in these founding values, which are about contributing to a better Africa and a better world. In consequence, our subscription to the notion of the ICC as a nation is grounded in this theoretical background. Yet, by and large, the ICC is an issue about which a deluge of raw passions have been released in the form of continent-wide debates from both African state parties and non-state parties to the ICC since it began executing its mandate in 2002. The apple of discord, at least from the African point of view, is the perception of anti-African bias. Some have even pointed out a few cases outside the African continent on which they submit the ICC could have set its judicial sights about, or sorry, could have set its judicial sights, but inexplicably has not. These accusations have met with the formal endorsement of the African Union, thus receiving political gravitas that renders their ignorance unhelpful in the light of the agency underlining humanity's moral responsibility to prevent gross human rights violations, prosecuting them where they occur, and thus extending justice to the victims of such violations. Despite these protestations, which may not be necessarily unwarranted, I would like us to recall with some trepidation the banality with which the loss of human life on the African continent has taken on the appearance of natural human landscape. It is worth noting that the ICC works on referral basis, either by the United Nations Security Council or by the aggrieved parties who remain dissatisfied with their national judicial systems on gross human rights abuse cases and therefore wish for an external recourse. My contention is that in the light of these debates and the continued need for justice for the ordinary people of Africa, an African Court of Human Rights is not out of the question. There may very well be a need for such a court vested with universal jurisdiction to prosecute gross human rights violations on the African continent. What is worth noting about this proposition, however, is that such a court is not envisaged as a substitution for the ICC. Instead, it is an initiative necessitated by the seeming inadequacies that have been attendant to the ICC in its short time of existence. The African Court of Human Rights will as such fill a void in the form of the widening gulf beginning to emerge between what the ICC was intended for and what it is turning out to be in the eyes of its African detractors and many in the developing South. This gulf or credibility gap is eroding the moral authority of the ICC almost beyond redemption. My thesis, therefore, is that the people of Africa deserve justice. Whether justice is dispensed from within Africa itself or outside is not the point. What matters is the urgent task of stopping the culture of gross human rights abuses and its attendant impunity that have been the hallmarks of the African condition for such a long time. It is an indictment on the human race that such inhuman acts as crimes against humanity 
often ignited by economic interests from outside Africa itself, can continuously recur on the same planet, which is largely indifferent while up to the eyeballs in decadent luxury, not unrelated, of course, to the proceeds of such theaters of war. I would like to pick an example to stress the point of how the world can, select, can be selective when it comes to the developmental and human rights interests of ordinary people of Africa. In 2013, our local newspaper, The Mail and Guardian, ran a story on the report by the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan at the World Economic Forum on Africa, which took place in Cape Town. The report stated that, and I quote, according to the panel's 2013 Africa Progress Report at the World Economic Forum on Africa taking place in Cape Town, the continent is losing more through illicit financial outflows than it receives in aid and foreign direct investment. The report found that trade mispricing or losses associated with the misrepresentation of export and import values alongside other illicit outflows cost the continent 38.4 billion US dollars and 25 billion US dollars respectively between 2008 and 2010. Kofi Annan called for a rule-based global system on tax transparency to be developed with the G20. All foreign-owned companies should be required to disclose the ultimate beneficiaries of their profits, Annan said. Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America, all major conduits, should signal their intent to clamp down on illicit financial flows. He also extended this call to players from other developing nations who have become increasingly active in Africa in the oil, gas, and mineral realm. The, con the content of this report is disturbing on many fronts. It implicates sections of the international business community in the continued underdevelopment of Africa. Predominantly, these self-serving business interests reside in the developed nations. Partly, at least, it explains the reason for Africa's status as a basket case, where Africans are robbed of their legitimate benefits by outsiders who originate from rules-based nations. It also implicates outside interests in the perpetuation of the misgovernance of Africa. It is a collusive enterprise between local political interests and outside commercial interests. At some level, political violence and destabilization result from this criminal practice against the collective interests of Africans. Except for some NGOs, academic literature, and ethically committed media, this type of narrative about the role of external commercial interests in the perpetuation of African poor governance and underdevelopment is virtually non-existent, as are, of course, the consequences. Such ethical considerations make for a compelling case for political actors on a global scale, including African leadership, to act firmly and decisively to guarantee basic human rights for all. More, hope, more helpfully, such broader conception of human rights definition enables a comprehensive, all-inclusive approach grounded in meta-legalistic discourse. It is therefore the duty of all of us, Africans and non-Africans alike, to build institutions attuned to our yearning for peace, stability, human security, as well as development and social advancement. 
I am of the view that the destiny of, of African humanity is too special to be left in the hands of only those who have been elected to office. While I agree that elected governments are legitimate and have to be given space to do their work, I also feel that ordinary Africans need to find or make space for themselves to ensure that they are part of the liberating process that seeks to restore their humanity. In this regard, civil society in Africa assumes an air of existential imperative. South Africa today is going through its worst crisis in both politics and leadership. Much is at stake in terms of good governance. Most of what we have envisioned through the construction of institutions during the birth of our system of democracy is under threat from grabby hands of self-serving leaders. As we said earlier on, bad leadership wrecks institutions, leading to poor governance. Some are beginning to dismiss the notion of South African exceptionalism in the light of the well-trodden post-colonial path we seem to be following. Yet, just as many South Africans believe not all is lost and that we have it within our power to reclaim this stolen legacy, among the historical agents poised for the epochal tasks are civil society and the independent media, including, to their credit, many formerly demobilized anti-apartheid activists. There can be no substitute for civil society and independent media in both stirring up and maintaining critical consciousness about the ethical basis of society. I'm of the mind that a firm, active, Africa-wide network of civil society is needed. With the help of social media and other forms of modern communication, we need to share experiences and compare notes as Africans to ensure that we hold to the highest standards possible those we elect to public office. In the first instance, I think our interdependence calls for a broad political leadership that values cooperation and inclusiveness. After all, as shown by the current African migration crisis, our political programs are contagious. While some problem may originate in one country, it ends up affecting us all. And in most cases, we all have to act together to address such problems. That requires cooperation than perhaps has been the case before. In some, Cooperation, inclusiveness, boldness, and decisiveness in addressing our collective problems are qualities for a political and civil leadership of our changing times. Together, they are the cornerstone for leadership in an increasingly interdependent and interconnected world. In addition to effective continent-wide leadership, our next important item on the agenda should be drastically reducing poverty, both within our individual countries and across the continent. After all, this is what good governance is all about, to bring about a better life for all citizens. We have already developed the continental body of governance, the African Union, as well as its economic arm, NEPAT. These are African achievements of the last decade and point to the possibility of much more that is positive if Africans of all description stand up to be counted. For example, the African peer review mechanism plays a crucial role in highlighting undesirable behavior that detracts from many African countries, uh, good political records by serving as a mirror to the reviewed nations for self-reflection purposes. 
The AU's objectives are, among others, the consolidation of democracy, peace and stability, human security, good economic governance, as well as sustainable development, human rights, health, gender equality, information and computer technology, integrated regional development, as well as cultural and heritage preservation and promotion. All these are key requirements for good governance anywhere in the world today. In fact, all these elements contained in the African Union's objectives are largely what accounts for the difference between successful and not so successful nations. I would therefore say for good governance to prevail, Africans of all backgrounds should remain engaged. No government, no matter how popular in the election stakes, should be left to get away with the impression that it can substitute itself for the masses of ordinary Africans. There can be no let up on the crucial issue of the will of the people. Civil society, independent media, enhanced quality of intra-African dialogue among all the stakeholders, the effective use of media, social media and other forms of platforms for educational purposes should all be mobilized for the achievement of the state of ever self-critical African politics. We have already seen genuine attempts in many cases by elected governments to do the right thing. They need to be encouraged. Broader society should always engage such governments and through them the continental bodies of governance such as the African Union should be pressured into staying focused on promoting African interests at all times. It is possible and I want to thank you for your attention. Sit over here, I'll sit over here. Sit there, you are the moderator. Thank you very much to our two speakers who will now turn into conversationalists. Um, so I'm sure we're all provoked uh, by the insights that our two speakers have given us, um, and I will now open up the floor for us to engage them with questions and comments if necessary. Uh, but before that, I will um, abuse the moderator's uh, privilege and pose a few questions of my own uh, while you ready yourselves. Um, President Motad, you spoke um, on various aspects uh, relating to the, the constitutional promise in Africa, the um, positivity that we have constitutional democracies and cited Kenya as an example of a, a thriving democracy. But for one Kenya, we have a Burkina Faso, we have a Togo, we have a DRC where there are constitutional failures, uh, where constitutions are being abused uh, for the privilege of those who uh, are incumbents. Um, how do we challenge such forms of nefarious government and uh, what can the African Union and other African states do in order to ensure that they hold other African countries uh, accountable and not only celebrate when they succeed, but also call them out when they fail? Um, and another point is the question of impunity uh, around the ICC. Um, and uh, you cited the fact that you support the creation of the African Court, um, but the African Court of, of Justice has the fundamental flaw that it would not have jurisdiction to try heads of state. Um, how do you reconcile that form of accountability and good governance if those who exercise uh, military power and effectively have the macro level responsibility for human rights abuses are not held accountable? Perhaps we can start there uh, before we move on to some questions. Okay. Uh, impunity around the ICC uh, 
in, in the African uh, continent uh, is, is a worrying development. However, we know that uh, the uh, former president of Chad was tried by an African uh, human rights court in Senegal and found guilty. Uh, so the, the, there's a, an example of uh, the role that such a court uh, can play because people who gave evidence against him were former uh, prisoners and relatives of people who disappeared uh, when he was uh, president of Chad. So it is possible to bring to book uh, any you know, head of state who's guilty of uh, gross violation of human rights. Uh, that's the point I would like to make. Then, of course, coming to the uh, countries like the DRC where uh, elections were due last year and the uh, president of the DRC, President uh, Joseph Kabila, uh, was reluctant to uh, leave office uh, because he would have had to simply preside over elections uh, because uh, the Constitution stipulates that he is only allowed to serve two consecutive terms. And he tried to find an extension. Uh, eventually, he was persuaded by the Roman Catholic bishops and cardinals uh, to agree that such elections would be held this year. Uh, it still remains to, to, to be seen whether it, indeed the elections would, would be held. Then we have a situation like uh, in uh, Rwanda. Rwanda uh, is streets ahead of many sister countries on the continent, just in terms of uh, you know, modernizing its systems uh, of governance, uh, as well as you know, uh, ensuring that uh, the application for any uh, document or uh, investment outlet opportunity uh, is done, you know, efficiently uh, within few days. Uh, whereas, uh, if I compare, you know, how they process business applications for, and therefore, you know, what really makes uh, investors who want to bring uh, foreign direct investments into, into a country uh, keen to go to such a country, are the, you know, streamlined systems of processing such applications. In South Africa, with all its modernization, and remember the South African economy was uh, in the main built around mining industry. But uh, if, if you want to go into greenfields investment in mining sector in South Africa, uh, from the day you submit your application for prospecting license, to the day in which you could bring earth movers on site to begin the process of production. It takes you eight years. It's an inordinate amount of time. And this is what uh, holds us back uh, on the continent. So in Rwanda, they've done exceptionally well in those respects. But the Constitution stipulates that the president, the elected president, can only serve a maximum of two consecutive terms. And a popular president in office uh, then calls for a referendum to allow him to run for uh, more terms. And of course, uh, the referendum outcomes are predictable, so he, he's had to contest elections, and he got 98% of the votes in those elections. Uh, point I'm making uh, by uh, you know, citing this example 
is that uh, many of our leaders tend to turn around and ask the wrong question. Uh, you know, the first time they are elected, uh, they have confidence in the ability of the people to elect them. But once they are in office and it's time to go, they uh, normally make statements to the fact that, well, you know, they look around and nobody seems ready to take over from them. That's what uh, President Museveni in Uganda has been saying oh, over a, a, a long period. So, <clears throat> correctly speaking, when it is time to go, if you have confidence in the people, go. Uh, don't spend any, uh, you know, uh, additional day in office. Uh, that's how it should be. If you know Africa, and, and and democracy in Africa is to be consolidated, then you know the laws are the laws. You can't uh, accept them and and later just make them elastic. Uh, you keep on changing. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good opportunity for us to segue into our open session. Um, but I think uh, it's important to note that we're discussing the challenges of governance in Africa, and one of the main challenges that uh, the president has touched on is the question of gender representation. And I'm acutely aware that three men are discussing the challenges of governance. So, 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 so what I'll do to compensate is that I'll give the first opportunity of three questions to women. Uh, so if there are any questions by women, please. <laughs> no questions? Certainly no questions. Okay, an open session then. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Nomfundo has a question. I uh, will take three questions. So, Nomfundo. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I'm oh, sorry. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, my name is Nomfundo. I'm also a PhD law student here at Oxford. I'm from South Africa. My question is to uh, Dr. Ambata, and I'm sort of talking about what it means to have actual economic emancipation, because you touched on that a bit. And I was thinking, since we're commemorating, you know, 40 years since the death of Biko, um, what does it mean to no longer be appendages of white society? And I think that's what sort of a lot of young people are trying to speak about, um, about like feeling as if, you know, years since the transition, there hasn't really been a change in the economic state of you know, black life. And um, a recent report from Statisa shows that this is disproportionately affecting young people between the ages of zero to 17. And I think often we feel as if the older generation is dismissing um, how we are seeing the world as it is right now. Um, and I think often, you know, we're seen as like, young people who don't really know what happened. Um, and yet what we're articulating is what we are experiencing now. And I just want to engage with you on that. Uh, that's the first question. Any other questions? There's a question ahead here. Um, yeah, Dr. Mbatsa, uh, this question is best. It, it's for you. Uh, it touches on policy. Uh, you compared, um, you were talking about how uh, we need to uh, reassess policy, in, particularly in South Africa. But it talks about, about policy in sub-Saharan sub Africa, basically. Um, I'm basing it on, uh, on uh, an argument by um, the great Homi Baba, who talks about mimicry. Right? He argues that uh, the problem with, with, with African psych is mimicry, that we sort of tend to not look at ourselves. It's, it's about identity. His, his book is, is Location of Culture. He talks about how we see ourselves and basically what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm asking is that the policies that we, we have adopted are policies that have been actually adopted, not have been produced by us as such. So you, you, you mentioned uh, innovation there. And the question is that through, since uh, uh, international development, it's not been, uh, it's, it hasn't got a great history in Africa. So how can we then uh, move forward in terms of changing the African psyche? in terms of looking at, at, at itself and accepting who, who, who the history that it's gone through. And then therefore from that will come up policies that will uh, be contextual and will then create space for innovation and will probably answer 
to the question that is behind me. Thank you. Um, any other questions at this stage? Okay, we'll take those two for now. Uh, I was pleased to hear from President uh, Motlanthi that uh, he said about a pan-African uh, human rights court because I think personally, I don't know much about Africa, I will admit, I'm relatively ignorant, but I do feel that you would benefit from a sort of United States of Africa kind of approach and the ANC's history, as you were highlighting earlier, Dr. Mabata, uh, sort of was... Uh, comparative, you know, you, you, you drew from other parts of Africa besides South Africa. And what this lady here has said, I think it would raise the image of, well, it would help African people generally if you had some kind of um, united sort of Afri following the European model in some ways. Uh, and it would also help direct investment as well within the African continent. Uh, and, and maybe simplify things if you did go down some kind of route where you united in some kind of uh, community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the two questions are interlinked. And uh, the first point, I think we must look at ourselves, you know. I was very much encouraged by the students' action when it came to the fees must fall, the issues they raised, the deprivation, and so on. And then uh, when the students started looking for solutions, first they had to find fault in somebody. And I was very much touched and surprised when the student directed their anger against institutions and buildings, pictures, and I said, there's something wrong here. And this wrong is not easy to identify because it's hidden somewhere in our being, in our existence. And that's, uh, I think, what most African countries face because of the economic backwardness. And because we said, with freedom will come free education. And if there is no education, education I regard it as enlightening, opening the mind. But if, like in South Africa today, education looks like it was better than during apartheid, then it brings about because, as we can all understand, there is only one democracy. Democracy means this and this and this. But you'll also agree with me that democracy then adapts to the socioeconomic condition, specifically cultural conditions. And uneducated people views and look or their worldview is quite different. And knowing that our African societies emanate from social structures that have been, or I don't want to say backward, but have not developed to a full uh, fruition. It means, like now, if I look at a president in under normal circumstances, a president is a president. I have no relation, other relationship than the fact that I elected and voted for him. But then creeps in something like he's our father, who's Ubaba. That in itself indicates that because these leaders we elected, but we also regard them as our fathers and mothers, and therefore it changes the attitude. What I'm trying to point out at is that the youth of today in South Africa should have directed their anger to the ANC government for having not fulfilled its promises and leave some of the structures 
because these structures, we need them for our children to learn from history that here was Cecil Rhodes. Here is a man who did, who did this and this to South Africa. Now, that anger was not directed at the ANC. And actually, what happened? The students looked for reconciliation with government to find a solution. And I knew very well that there won't be a solution. Dr. Pata, if I could just interject here yeah. very briefly uh, and ask. Uh, uh, I'm afraid I have to interject. Oh, yeah. 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 Because yeah. President, to yeah. Do I, I do apologize. <laughs> Uh, to spoil the past, but, uh, there is a conference here. Perhaps you can the question of that conference and the conference dinner, which was already started. Oh, okay. Perhaps you yeah? yeah? can yeah. just touch on the question of uh, Pan-Africanism briefly before. Mm. This, oh. that, uh, if, you could, uh, yeah. if you could accompany me to dinner. Uh, oh, yeah. right, right away? Right away. I'm oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my okay. apologies. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. But Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. If we can just stay seated, uh, the president will be going for dinner. Um, but we can explore the questions yeah. that have been yeah. raised uh, thus far. Um, perhaps you can conclude that yeah. thought and then answer the question of pan-Africanism yeah, yeah. uh, before um, we draw um, this conclusion. I'll, I'll, let me just wrap up by saying, so in seeking for a solution from, from a, a, the ANC government, they then, the students, that look at power relations and therefore said things are not happening because of white power. When actually it was the ANC in government. The students should have been bold enough to say, no, no, you are in government. We elected you. You are our representative. Government is nothing else but structures that we put in power to change our lives economically and otherwise and address these issues. Now, that happened, and the reason I'm saying that happened is because of other influences in the way we look at power relations and then adapt to uh, ethics and behavior that says, uh, that almost mean that this government cannot do wrong because it's a black government. You see, that's where now Steve because emancipation, because we have to liberate ourselves from that. That whereas yes, we were oppressed as African people. When we become free, it means we have to look at ourselves. Differently. And one of the reasons I mentioned is that the ANC regards itself as a liberation movement because it is afraid of taking the responsibility of a governing party. When it says it's a liberation movement, it wants to say, no, we are still struggling together as Africans. Mm -hmm. You see? You, you understand? Mm -hmm. So, uh, this uh, identity is hindered because we are supposed to identify ourselves different as free citizens, free citizens as equals, you see? And once we reach that stage, but I know that that stage can only be reached if the economy, if we take, you know, black economic empowerment, it was not going to empower the majority of black people. It was a good tool, but it can only it's limited to a, a certain percentage of the elite. Mm -hmm. For us, that's why, let me say it, we, I get inspiration from the EFF. <laughs> because the EFF changed everything and said, no, 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 we want to hold this ANC government accountable for what is going on. And the politics of South Africa have changed today. And as Comrade Ahmed Katrada, who wrote the foreword to my book, said, the youth league of the ANC died when Julius Malema was expelled from the ANC. He took the youth. And I'm happy that he has rejuvenated 
the youth, and this youth is acting independent. It has found its roots and it's questioning, just like the youth league of the Mandelas and Tambos. The youth league of oh, Tambo, Mandelas, uh, uh, Mutupeng, uh, Potlako, they, que- they, didn't, they didn't fight with the uh, racist regime then. They pointed their fingers at the leadership of the ANC, Dr. Koma. They said, we don't agree with the way you do things. But perhaps then we so, can explore some more questions. And there's also the question of pan-Africanism that perhaps can draw broader themes around the African continent as opposed to locating within the South African case study, which is deeply fascinating. So if there are uh, other questions. So we have one, two questions here. Perhaps we can start on the side. Good evening. My name is Kaiya Makaka from South Africa. Um, And you spoke earlier about um, your analysis of the ANC and its shortcomings dating back to exile. And then you mentioned about the various policies and plans that you then suggested are actually a weakness because it seems that there have been several governments. But if policies are meant to look forward, trying to prevent challenges, um, but also being responsive to emerging challenges, emerging opportunities, why then did you see the several plans and policies as a weakness, and why is that not a strength? Question over there. Um, I just wanted uh, to hear your opinion. You touched on an African union, um, and I think the gentleman down there did as well. Um, And I wondered, if you think about South Africa, it seems a lot of the problems are the open borders and the fact that you have so many other countries relying on the economy of South Africa to um, hold them up or to come to South Africa for the opportunities that are available there in comparison to the sister countries. So do you think it's actually hindering the South African economy and the um, prosperity of the South Africans because of the open borders and the idea of an African Union? So uh, two questions. Is there any other question? Okay. Um, So we'll give... Dr. Mbata, an opportunity to answer all three questions yeah. uh, all together, yeah. um, and then we'll wrap up the session. Okay. Yeah, let me start with uh, Makata. You know, uh, when an ANC leader takes the platform today, uh, you have to think twice what is he articulating or what is she articulating. There's a difference to understand whether this person is speaking to a decision or a resolution or policy. <laughs> I can make you an example. The uh, ANC president, when he closed the national policy conference in uh, uh, June, July, he came up with an idea that the losing candidate for president of the ANC should become the second deputy president of the ANC. He was closing conference. It had not been discussed in conference. It, he was never understood by anyone what he meant. In other words, I'm trying to say, the ANC is failing to speak to policies. And you know why? It's failing to speak to policy because the ANC conflates ANC structures with government. These policies that I'm talking about, they were not produced within the ANC. You see, RDP was produced by bureaucrats. And from there, as Giza and so on. Now, because the ANC is in government, it thinks these are ANC policies. No, they are not ANC policies. What happens? You have the Minister of Policy, Evaluation, and so on, Minister Jeff Hatev. He sits in government. He asks the bureaucrats, what is wrong? They come with proposals. The same minister, he takes these proposals to an an ANC structure, NEC or policy conference. The same minister with the bureaucrats, they sit now with under a different cap as ANC people. They discuss this, discuss, and then they make proposals. 
they adopt. The same minister goes to government, to cabinet. <laughs> uh, elaborates on it, then they adopt. It does not work like that. What I mean, the ANC itself doesn't have aspects to develop its own policies. Because as a party with its own program, it must say on education, on health, this is this. What do you mean? Explain to itself first. And then instruct people in government what to do. And if they fail, they must remove them. But it never happens. That's the problem. So I don't think there is any policy. The only policy that was there is before liberation. Simple and clear. Perhaps, now, perhaps we can move on to the question of pan African the next women yeah. and, and tap into some of your experience in terms of uh, your diplomatic service around the African continent and qu answering that question yeah. about the pan African project. I'll, I'll, I'll Is come, it a dead I'll, project? I'll come to that. Yeah. E economy. No, uh, the South African economy was more developed. We know why uh, and so on. So by the time uh, the ANC took over, it was at a certain level. But you see, that economy was dependent on mining and so on, and migrant labor was from the neighboring countries. And almost all the countries around South Africa are dependent. For me, that's not a hindrance. It means you, we must develop that further. We're losing the opportunity to develop ourselves. And in, in losing that opportunity, we create problems for the neighboring countries. In Lesotho today, there is no governance. Swaziland, there is a kingdom there, and so on. But you see, you have more Basotos, Botswanas, people from Swaziland in South Africa because, of the, the, because the economy has not changed. You still have migrant labor as it was in the 1900s. The ANC has changed nothing. Everybody comes, if you go to South Africa on Fridays, everybody moves out of Johannesburg, going to the Eastern Cape, to Limpompo, and so on. On Sunday, the airports, the cars are empty because people are coming back. We have not changed the patterns, and we have not grown the economy in such a way that it can create more and uh, uh, new jobs. With the advancement of technology, with the youth today that is graduating, and, uh, uh, but becomes jobless after graduating because the economy has not uh, developed. And the ANC as a governing party has not used the ex expertise from the universities that we have in South Africa. Instead, they debate what is white monopoly capitalism and so on, when we should leave that to professors like you. Now, at the end, Pan-Africanism. Very briefly, please. <laughs> yeah, Pan-Africanism. I think it is hindered because the youth in Africa is not playing the role it's supposed to be playing. And uh, I understand why because of the development, because of the education in, Asia, in West Africa and so on. If you deprive people of education, you are depriving them of being enlightened to see things differently. I think it then remains among the few people who are educated and mostly who are in Europe. Because once they get educated and then there are op no opportunities in Africa, then we remain in Europe. And then, uh, I mean, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was one of the best countries when Mo uh, President Mugabe took over. That youth is gone. It's here in the UK. It's in South Africa. It's everywhere, but not in Zimbabwe because of the socioeconomic conditions and because, like President, former President Mutante explained, dictatorial tendencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can end there. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mbata. And, uh, of course, thank you uh, to President Motlante in his absence. Um, but also thank you all for coming today. Um, but there's someone who is dedicated to thanking us all, um, Anne McKenna, and she will... Uh, be coming now. I think she just stepped out for a moment. Um, those of you who'd like a book that is signed by Dr. Mbata, he will be available after this session. So um, 
please do stick around. Let them better perhaps you can take your seat. Yeah. Thank you. So um, if you will indulge me, I know I'm the only thing standing between you and dinner, so I will be exactly three minutes brief, maybe three and a half. Um, so I am Anne McKenna. I manage the, Oxford, the Africa Oxford Initiative. This is a cross-university platform for managing the relationship between Oxford University and African uh, colleagues. So we have, um, it's a pretty much a grouping of Oxford staff and students that are committed to uh, the future of the African continent. Uh, we have one thing is um, a communication platform for all, things, for all things Africa in Oxford. So we showcase research that is going on in, the, in, in, in Oxford that is related to Africa. We um, kind of highlight uh, grants that are available, research, uh, research grants, travel grants, scholarships for students, and so forth. We're also a facilitator for the development of new um, equal, equitable and sustainable partnerships between Oxford University and African academics and researchers. We uh, provide some monies for travel grants for people to meet and have conversations about shared interests. And we also um, are setting up a new Africa and a new place for visiting scholars from Africa to spend some time in Oxford and take advantage of the resources and, and networks that are available here. We also work with several partners in the continent, uh, including the African Academy of Sciences, to foster this, um, to support the work that they are doing in terms of capacity development in uh, research and academic excellence across the continent. So if you want to know more about this, uh, talk to me and Kukua. Afterwards, we have a research pool of about 350 academics working across 125 institutions in 28 countries in Africa. So there's a quite a lot to um, learn from what we have done. But that's not the business of the day. Please allow me to um, give a very big thank you to Dr. Kulumbate. It's, this has been... But uh, this has been really, really fascinating, very interesting insights on the workings of ANC from the history and, and, and what has gone wrong, basically, and what we can do as young people where we can plug in and, and be of a benefit to the reformation of the ANC. I'm, I'm very fascinated to note that Oxford has kind of, although it has a very complicated relationship with South Africa, we've kind of been involved in the whole thing with... Um, the founder of ANC actually being an Oxford alum, Pixley, Kaisaka, Seme. So I think there's something to be proud of, of the relationship that we've had. And so I'm really hoping that from the insights that you've given us today, somebody in this room is going to go on and be that person who reforms the working of the ANC and provides a flagship um, party that uh, the rest of Africa can look up to. So thank you very much indeed for your very insightful awards. So thank you as well to Naira Woods and the BSG team. I'm really grateful. Um, they've had to rush for other events, but we're really, really very grateful for all the work that you've put in for putting together the event, for the support of African-related events in Oxford, and we're really, really um, grateful for that. And in absentia, please convey our gratitude to um, the president. Um, uh, Kalema has been really uh, a good friend of Oxford. This is his second time here, and we're really happy that he makes time every now and then to come and visit us and share his wisdom. They say where I come from that uh, what, a, what an elder sees while sitting is much more than a young person can see well standing up. So we're always very much impressed by his insights whenever he visits us. And so um, please allow me to very much thank my brother and Jody uh, and, the, uh, and the African Student Society uh, for putting this together for getting the invites done and all that, we're really, really eternally grateful. And we hope that this continuing conversations will go on even as the new students come so we can keep engaging with what's happening even while we are very busy with our academic lives. And finally, please, thank you so very much, all of you who have persevered to the end uh, <laughs> for sitting through these very interesting discussions and also for participating and for your very thought-provoking um, issues and, and concerns that you've raised. And I really hope that you've come out of here with new insights that you will go on and build your interest and buy the book on your way out and learn more about this this um, this political one of the oldest political parties in Africa so thank you very much I will leave it at that and I really hope you have you've enjoyed yourself and have a lovely evening everyone <laughs>